Welcome everybody to our panel on AR and VR technology. What industries will it revolutionize next? I think everyone here is probably familiar with augmented reality and virtual reality technology. You're at a policy conference focused on technology at South by Southwest, uh, I, I hope. Um, but I think that a lot of people may perceive this only from a consumer standpoint, right? You may have chased Squirtle and Pikachu around your local park and been using AR and maybe known it, maybe not. Um, you have probably tried an Oculus or a Google Cardboard and experienced a gaming situation or maybe an educational experience uh, on virtual reality. Those things drove this market to be one of the hottest items for Christmas, right? Kids, adults, they want to play with this. It's incredibly compelling if any of you have ever used it. You get sucked in and you want to be able to explore. It's not just an experience where you're taking in information, you are truly interacting within it, which is very compelling. So I don't blame you all for putting it on your Christmas and birthday lists. But I think that there's a lot more to virtual reality and augmented reality technology that we hope to explore today as to where it's going to really have the biggest social, business, economic impacts. And that may not actually be in the consumer market. That may be in industries like healthcare, in industries like education, in industries like corporate communications, or even in mental health, where you could see truly groundbreaking innovations and impacts from augmented reality and virtual reality technologies uh, that may be very different from what you experience on the consumer side. So today, with these three distinguished panelists, I hope we can explore those themes a little bit. Uh, first, we have Ann Hobson. Uh, from the R Street Institute. R Street Institute is a free market think tank that focuses on technology policy in Washington, D.C. and in the states across the country. Uh, Anne is a leader on augmented reality, artificial intelligence, virtual reality policy, studied the issues extensively, and has written about them in many thoughtful ways recently. So looking forward to what she has to say about where we're going to be going in the future uh, on these technologies. Uh, and we have Tim Huang from Google. Uh, as you all know, if you read the New York Times and have tried your Google Cardboard, it's awesome. Um, but there's a lot more to virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and um, augmented reality that's happening at Google. Excited to hear from Tim about that. Um, frankly, if this really is Tim, Tim has um, possibly automated his, his own job in the past, although I don't know if he will comment on, on that. Um, he has also been a leader in crowdfunding, in creating very novel conferences, including one for real, live, living, breathing memes. And I, I believe you've also created an army of highly intelligent Twitter bots, right? Uh, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> so I I if they start taking over our Twitter feeds during this conversation and providing real valuable information, don't be surprised. Uh, and then we have James Harrison, who is the public policy lead at Oculus. Uh, Oculus is a leader in virtual reality technology uh, everywhere from gaming to military training. Uh, there's some incredibly s compelling stuff happening on the Oculus headset and on the Oculus platform as far as content go goes. Uh, so very, very excited to hear uh, from James on that. Prior to working at Oculus, uh, he actually worked on relief efforts uh, relating to rebuilding uh, after Hurricane Sandy and also has spent time working at the Small Business Administration. So to kick things off, what we're going to start down at ground level in real life, or as real of life as you can have with virtual reality. Uh, and, and I'll start with you, James, about what is virtual reality and, and augmented reality currently revolutionizing? You know, we talked a little bit uh, about gaming and those personal experiences, but where else do we already see this technology having a real impact? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great question. Uh, and you know, I think one of the really, the really awesome things about uh, my work you know, with, uh, with governments around the world and thinking about sort of public policy and VR and AR um, is all the ways that, you know, folks are looking to apply virtual reality and augmented reality to everyday sort of fields and social challenges. Uh, you know, we've already seen great sort of films and storytelling that we're, we're sort of learning how to sort of build new techniques and tell new stories in, in big ways and, and really rely on VR's ability to, to help us empathize and, and, and sort of transport people to new places. Uh, but it's really exciting to also talk to museums and cultural institutions around the world who are thinking about how do you digitize 
uh, some of your records? How do you make sure that collections that are hard to transport or expensive to transport, uh, that they're available all around the world? Um, and, and some of the projects that, that we're excited and, and work on and, and when we think about sort of the future of VR at Oculus, you know, looking at the potential for the technology uh, as a computing platform. So thinking about all of the things that we currently do in 2D and all of the, the sort of computing that we do, everything from programming to word processing, um, things that are sort of second nature to us on our cell phones or on our personal computers, um, really thinking about what that would be like in 3D and um, you know areas where virtual reality is going to make those applications uh, even easier. Um, we have an Oculus education team, team, that's, team that spends a lot of time thinking about what are the things that are, we're going to learn better uh, in, in three dimensions, in, in VR uh, and, and in AR. Um, so, you know, I think there are a lot of really exciting applications, a lot of fields, a lot of governments um, that, that are looking into what are the ways that we can sort of expand the reach of this technology and what are going to be the things that we can do more efficiently uh, or the places where we can learn even more or tell stories even better uh, in, in VR and AR. So excited to, to, to talk through that uh, with this group. Tim, obviously Google is no stranger to thinking very big uh, about issues, um, but I think ironically people probably know and are most familiar with Google in the VR space from the most simple VR platform out there, Cardboard. Um, tell us a little bit about why Google decided to go low-tech VR first and then what you're thinking big about. Sure, definitely. And, and I think it is in fact the, the small thing that is the big thing with Cardboard. Um, you know, I, I think we kind of always think about sort of the history of computing, right? Where when you began, you had these huge machines that were really expensive and were limited to only a small set of uses. Uh, but then you sort of had a PC revolution and basic computing became cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And we saw all these really interesting new applications form. Uh, and I think that's what's kind of underlying our direction on things like Cardboard and other projects that we've done since, uh, for example, um, Daydream, which is basically saying, can we turn mobile into a VR platform? And, and the game there is to basically say, can we basically take this amazing technology and make it much more democratically available? And in doing so, unleash a bunch of uses that you know, any one company or any one publisher would never come up with. Um, and so I think when you see things like Cardboard, which is almost kind of anti-technological in the way that's built, right? It's just like literally origami with Cardboard. Um, I think it's very much a representation of this idea of how do we take these experiences that you can get uh, traditionally have only been able to get with these very expensive kind of products uh, and bring them uh, to a much larger audience. And, and having a broader perspective on the entire industry, right? I think sometimes, especially uh, in our technology bubble, we get caught up thinking about the possible. And so when you talk about VR and AR, you think, okay, when do we have this hyper-realistic interaction when I don't know if I'm interacting with a human or an avatar and if I'm in real reality or virtual reality. Um, that probably misses most of the real world applications in the foreseeable future of the technology. Uh, how do you reconcile those two goals of making it relevant now and aspiring to something you know, very compelling in the future uh, and not getting too lost in trying to achieve that future end goal? Yeah, so I think that um, the key word here is going to be experiential. So you listen to the radio and you watch TV, but you experience VR. And what that really means to me, um, so Vladimir Nabokov, who's a famous writer, he wrote um, an essay on writing. Writing is an earlier medium, just like VR is going to be the next medium. Um, and he said that writing is powerful in, in three ways. So it's, it enchants, it, and it teaches, and it also um, allows you to learn. Uh, so I think the key there will be enchanting. So I'm pretty excited. I don't know who's here has seen Lord of the Rings. Anybody? Love Lord of the Rings, huge fan. So in the first scene, uh, Gandalf is riding into town and there's Frodo sitting by a tree and he's reading a book. And when I think about what I wanna do in VR, one of the things that comes to mind is just being able to enter these scenes um, and do things within them. So we're gonna get to this um, later, I'm sure, but it really is about presence and it is about agency. So if I can do an action, read a book, and be sitting there and be Frodo and Gandalf rolls into town, how cool would that be? And that experiential aspect is going to create a memory that is more powerful than watching that on a television screen. So essentially what you're saying is that in order to truly enjoy and become immersed in VR, it does not have to be perfect. It only has to be good enough, right, to draw you in. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what that means? What does a good VR experience entail? How do you technologically make that happen for someone when they are Frodo in, in that scene? where it may be a little bit imperfect, but you still are able to trick the mind into really thinking that you're experiencing Frodo's way of life. How does that work? 
Sure. So uh, I think there's a huge difference between 360 videos where you're just standing in a scene that someone took a picture of and you can turn around, um, and then this idea of agency. So there are a couple ways that you can get that, and one of the ways I'm very excited about is haptics, which are touch-based suits. So you can have a T-shirt that will pressure, give pressure to your body when you're moving in VR, um, and you can also have gloves. Uh, and so at CES, great show, want to plug it, um, you should all go. Uh, they, uh, they, have this, they had this demo um, where you're in room scale, which is where there's sensors, and you're standing up, and so you really feel with the headset on that you are somewhere else, and it can track your motion. And with those gloves, you were able to pick up things, and you were able to throw them. Or in one scene, I just walked up to a table and just cleared it. And it was incredibly powerful to, to do that. But also, you can throw a ball, and it can go forever. Because one of the things about VR is you don't have to be confined to the laws of physics or even the laws of, of time. Uh, you can speed up and slow down time. And I can tell you, it, it's pretty great to throw a ball and have it go forever, because you're like, man, I'm strong. Yeah. Well, and it's worth pointing out that, you know, I think, and this is being worked out in VR right now, is this battle between, you know, simulation and realism turn out to be two very separate things, right? Like, movies can feel deeply real, even though they're not perfect 3D simulations of the world. And I think we're still kind of working out what are the what are the what are the tropes of this genre that will help people kind of navigate a space and kind of evoke or enchant, as Anne was saying. So since we've gotten onto filmmaking in VR and evoking and enchanting, I want to introduce uh, another emotion that I think uh, VR has um, got us thinking about, uh, which is is empathy. And sometimes I in the technology space, we see a criticism that our device gets in the way of human interaction, in the way in the way of human understanding. Uh, in, in VR, I recently watched the Clouds Over Cedra, uh, where you actually are experiencing what it's like to be in a refugee camp, and it's a whole different way of being part of the content. I don't even want to say consuming the content. Can you talk a little bit about the whole new ways uh, that VR can approach storytelling and introduce different emotions that may not have ever been able to be there in another storytelling medium? Yeah, I guess I can I can kick things off. You know, a lot of times, you, know, you hear folks talk about VR and AR, and, and particularly VR, and you know, bring up sort of the possibility that you know we all might enter our own little worlds and you know and sort of not interact uh, with each other. But I think we see a lot of potential first around sort of social experiences, be they tied to filmmaking explicitly or uh, you know doing things that we like to do on other mediums uh, in in VR. But, but getting back to the, the point about empathy, um, you know, some of the most powerful things I've seen are sort of the small interactions and projects that happen when sort of filmmakers take 360 cameras or are beginning to sort of put uh, experiences in VR, um, you know, all the way up to sort of some of the, 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 the highest quality and, um, you know, some of the, the sort of most expensive, let's say, VR experiences, but, but on the lower end. We, we, we pioneered a small program with, with schools in the Bay Area where we just went to classrooms and said, here are 360 cameras and VR devices. And we wanted students, high school students, uh, to sort of learn how to begin filming in 360 and then create uh, films that really sort of talked about their communities and the things that they were learning. And, and just that, and I know that's, that's not sort of full virtual reality by any stretch, but just that experience of learning how to develop film in 360 and then, you know, put together what were, you know, really beautiful sort of five minute vignettes, um, the, the, the potential for people to tell stories, to tell them in a meaningful way and then really put you in their point of view and whether, again, that involves high-end VR or, or, or just 360 photo and video, uh, I think is, is really compelling and, it, and is really, to me, I think the answer to the questions about, you know, will this sort of technology uh, expand, you know, our ability to understand each other and go new places. And it's really exciting to sort of see at all ends of the spectrum, whether it's tinkerers on one end and high school students who are just learning the technology to sort of some of the world's great filmmakers and international institutions really pushing the boundaries of storytelling and, and virtual reality. Yeah, and I think it's worth emphasizing that, like, we're still early days in terms of the, the hardware as well, where I think we're yeah. limited by hardware and we're limited by connectivity. Yeah. So there's this, all these social experience you, these experiences you could imagine designing that are just really difficult right now because transferring all the data that VR provides from one place to another uh, and allowing people to communicate in VR is, like, a, a tough task in of itself. Yeah, there's actually, there's two uh, videos that are experiences you can have um, that I like to point out. One of them is uh, a police shooting, and in the police shooting, the perspective chains, changes as you go through this uh, VR experience. So first you're the bystander, then you're the victim, 
um, and then you're the policeman. And it becomes clear that most of the situations we're in are gray areas. And so you get to explore like how, how does that uh, affect you emotionally and, and do you really understand the actions that these players took? And then the other one is just, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen like the drunk driving, don't text and drive videos where you're like sitting in a car and then texting happens and then boom. Well, they have a, a VR version of that that actually drives you into it in a way that is different than watching it on a screen. Um, so you look down and they're your hands and you have a phone and that makes all the difference. And then I think that's a very powerful way to, again, empathize with the situation that people can be in. So we have a, a very powerful storytelling mechanism. Um, how do we take that leap to getting the story out to a wider audience? Because we are still talking about, um, in many cases, a, a fairly expensive or exclusive piece of technology. Um, what, where's the industry looking to take these messages? Because we all know that they're very compelling and we all know that they will have a very big impact uh, in many of the situations that were brought up, um, but only if they actually are able to be delivered to end users. Um, and I'll let you start with that. Sure, so adoption is going to be a, a huge challenge. And I think that it, it's hard, especially for high-end experiences, which really do draw people in and you get that agency and presence, to be differentiated from uh, experience where you're just with the cardboard. So I think there's a, a balance to be played between uh, getting that those higher-end experiences out there um, and then having that low-end experience be someone's first experience, which I think can be very hard to get past that. Yeah, I think the, the whole design principle or question that we need to ask is thinking about um, what is that first experience, right? If you want to call back to history, like what was the first book to get people really hooked on books, right? It's kind of a weird question, but that must have happened at some point. Or like what was the first movie that got people hooked on movies, right? Like that also must have happened at some point, yeah. right? And, and I think there's, there's an interesting question here both about distribution, right? Like what are the platforms that we think will make it possible for people to experience this medium? Um, but there's also this really important question around content too, right? What will be the most accessible thing that will be sort of the first stepping stone into getting people excited about it? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing I would add, sort of building on that, that sort of thought question of, you know, what were the, the first sorts of, what were the hooks, the things that sort of got people really interested in a, in a new technology? I mean, I think the other piece uh, sort of related to that is, and, and, and what a lot of conversations with, you know, whether it's cultural institutes around the world or, or governments, you know, wh where are all the places where, you know, we're doing, whether it's traditional video or other, t or other sorts of broadcasts uh, where we might sort of say, all right, you know, let's, let's overlay VR and see if, uh, see if, you know, in our museums or in our libraries, if there are cool ways to sort of introduce people to these technologies um, and, and sort of speed up the number of stories that are told and the audiences that, that they reach uh, and sort of our imagination about sort of what's possible uh, in, in, in the in the medium. So we've talked a lot about personal use and personal understanding. Uh, do you think maybe people may actually be first introduced to their, you know, sort of aha moment with VR, not at home or in a store, but possibly at work or at school? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think so, right? I mean, if, if storytelling is really key to this medium, which I think it is, right? then in, in many ways, I think the fact that it is such a visceral way of expressing ideas may make it actually really ideal in the education context. Uh, now we have to figure out exactly the right way of kind of making this truly kind of pedagogical, but uh, I personally, as someone who's a Montessori kid, right, that whole kind of educational mode is just based on like tangible things. The notion of VR being able to deploy that like in a costless way or very much less expensive way um, is really exciting to me. Yeah, to add on to that, um, I think that job training is another application that we don't think very much about, but uh, for example, Boeing is using augmented reality so that the people that are designing the ends of the wingtips can see where, they're, where the pieces are supposed to go. So it's like you could actually use this technology to uh, train people in, in how to be more productive in their jobs. In the cab on the way over here, I was talking to a guy who puts up telecommunications infrastructure, so antennas on top of uh, roofs, for example. And um, those have to be pointed in a way such that they're aligned with true north. And he was like, it would be so cool if we could just have an AR headset that would show you where True North was, it would save so much time and make me so much more productive at my job. And I thought that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that that raises a very interesting point that we, as people working in, in VR, whether in industry or in thought, probably won't be the ones coming up with every single relevant application for, for AR and VR. Um, as you know, makers of this technology, both Google and Oculus, how do you 
work with people like, let's say, this, this telecommunications in installer to make sure that industries that you may never have thought of in the past are able to seamlessly tap into your technology? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we see is, you know, organically around the world, there are a lot of really interesting and innovative partnerships that sort of spring up. And, you know, everything from the hard sciences to education to, you know, again, storytelling and filmmaking. Um, and so we spend a lot of time, you know, sort of really looking out and, and seeing where those are coming together and if there are ways, whether it's lending technical assistance or sometimes, you know, on, on the public policy side, sort of trying to support and fund with devices or, uh, or other sort of uh, 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 support, uh, sort of these small projects that really sort of bring together communities of, say, doctors and developers or, you know, what might be, uh, you know, chemists and, and, and sort of storytellers in VR. So again, I think a lot of this is happening. There are sort of small trade associations all over the globe, meetup groups uh, that really sort of push compelling projects. And then, of course, actors in the private sector, like Ann mentioned, what's going on at Boeing. Um, so there's, there's a lot of this work, and I think what we try to do is say, well, where can we be additive? Of, you know, where is it that there's space for us to, to help really, um, you know, to help really push some of these, these innovative partnerships. I think the challenge that we see, though, in that is that often you're bringing together communities that, you know, again, in a new technology uh, or new sets of technologies like VR and AR, uh, communities who haven't worked together. Um, so, you know, again, pulling the example of sort of doctors who are building these great new experiences in VR, whether to do health training or other applications, you know, they are just as new as the, uh, as the content and the developer teams at VR, um, you know, as, as, as you would expect. So, you know, there are all of these challenges with, 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 you know, seeing an individual project all the way through and then figuring out the right ways to scale that. But, you know, as a company, what we try to do is when we see really great projects like that, you know, we try to be there and, and, and support and sometimes provide equipment and other things, um, but, but really push these communities to, to come together and, uh, and, and build more of these exciting experiences all over the globe. Bring this on life a little bit. Would you be able, James, to highlight for our audience one of the most compelling innovative projects that Oculus has been able to go and work with someone else in, in a business or educational setting and say, well, we've really been able to make a big difference here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and this, you know, again, the partners are really the focus of a lot of the work uh, that we do. But last year, we began working with the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles uh, and uh, two, two doctors there and their team uh, and a development team around the world on trying to recreate uh, sort of simulations around uh, difficult uh, difficult surgeries and, and medical emergencies uh, for children. Um, and so they've been working over the course of the last almost year now on sort of putting together modules that uh, can replace what can be expensive mannequin training, uh, both purchasing the mannequins and doing high fidelity uh, simulations. Uh, they've looked at sort of taking uh, what the entire emergency room experiences holistically, everything from sort of the stress and the noise, uh, and, and then working through all of these sort of individual steps that a doctor in, in sort of these high stakes, low frequency situations has to go through, and, and trying to create sort of a basic training module that can then be replicated and reduces cost. So this is a project that, that we're going to be sort of announcing and, and rolling out uh, over the course of the coming weeks. Uh, but, but work like that and, you know, just trying to seed small projects like that, again, that bring together these diverse communities to solve sort of real world challenges and, and show that there might be ways to do things that we're doing at cost, uh, you know, in other sectors um, that, that could really be reduced and, and really supplemented by, by sort of bringing all of these communities together. So more to come there, for sure. And Tim, I certainly don't want Oculus to be the only one dominating the cool <laughs> news section uh, of this panel. So what's the most compelling, awesome thing that Google has entered into a partnership around VR on? Uh, so I'm really interested in, so one of the maybe unexpected applications I can talk about is this interesting intersection that's emerging between AI uh, and VR. So one of the main challenges in a number of AI applications is training a system um, to, to behave in the real world. Right? And traditionally, the strategy of that has been, OK, we'll go do the thing in the real world, collect information about it, and you can train a system on how to do it. Um, uh, one approach that a lot of researchers are starting to play around with now uh, are uh, basically creating virtual worlds for AI agents to operate in, and then train based on that. Um, and so. Yeah, sorry, this what is maybe a little bit too much. No, it's not too much. It's like for everyone, what does that mean? So basically, the idea is uh, say you need to create a robot that will run a maze, for instance. Yeah. Um, one strategy could be you physically build the maze and you have the robot run through it many times until it learns how to do it. Uh, and, and that's the way you teach the robot. 
one mechanism that a lot of researchers are playing with is basically why don't we create that maze in a virtual world mm -hmm. and have a virtual agent run through it many times. And the data that it gets from doing that is very similar to the data that you would get from doing it in the yeah. real world. And in doing so, you can actually train these agents virtually. So there's one paper that was released recently where they were able to train a drone to fly autonomously um, by first training in a virtual world and then allowing that knowledge, basically, to be built into a real robot. Um, and so uh, one, of the, one of the interesting applications that we've seen, and, and I think one of Google's strategies in this space is there's partnerships, but there's also open source. Mm -hmm. So uh, DeepMind, one of the Alphabet companies, uh, has released this thing called Lab, which is basically an open source um, platform where anyone can kind of experiment with using this sort of methodology. And we're starting to see some really, really interesting results there. Yeah, I foresee a situation that possibly would be too dangerous to, to test in real life, you know, particularly, let's say, a military setting. Sure, I think that's right. And, and I think, you know, um, so we talked about this project at last year's I.O., which was kind of a funny one, where we're trying to figure out how to get robot hands to pick up objects. Mm -hmm. And so the strategy has been, like, let's have a bunch of robot hands try to pick up lots and lots of objects. And like, that's something that's like, really difficult and complicated to set up. But you could imagine setting up virtual environments that make that sort of testing a lot more accessible to a lot more people. So we've discussed uh, a lot of very compelling technologies, a lot of interesting places that we may be able to go in the future. Um, but you all came to Innovation Policy Day. Um, what is standing in the way of some of the most compelling ideas in, in VR and AR, whether it's in education, whether it is in healthcare, whether it is in military applications? What is the biggest obstacle? Is it technological? Is it policy? Is it understanding? Is it a combination of these three things? Uh, and with the overarching vision of the industry, uh, I'll let you start with that one. Sure, so I can comment on the policy challenges. Uh, so I analyzed Pokemon Go and the reaction of lawmakers to that technology to sort of try to foresee what some of the issue areas are gonna be. And I came up with three big ones. So it's cybersecurity, privacy, and safety, I think are gonna be the three. Um, so with safety, for example, uh, with Pokemon Go, you're walking around in the real world and information is overlaid on top of that. And you go to physical locations. Well, the real world's a dangerous place, and, and that interaction has caused uh, some trouble. So, for example, there's a, a law called Pidgey's Law, named after Pokemon, in Illinois, where they're trying to uh, compel Niantic, the creator of Pokemon Go, uh, to actually have to um, comply with removing Pokestops, like physical locations, uh, and there's a fine if they don't do it in a certain amount of time. Um, and so I think, like, you, you get those real world, virtual world, uh, interactions and, and they turn into real policy issues. With cybersecurity, you have data collection. This also has an effect in, in privacy as well. And when Pokemon Go was released, uh, Senator Al Franken sent a letter to their CEO and was like, hey, you're collecting a lot of data. How are you gonna use that? Uh, how long are you gonna keep it? And asked a lot of questions that got companies thinking about um, what they're gonna have to do about that data. Anything you guys wanna add to? That? Uh, I think I'll pick up on the understanding one. I mean, in yeah. terms of like these different kinds of categories, where can policy be most effective? Uh, and I think that's, that's a big piece of it, right? I think right now, because virtual reality is kind of this science fiction technology, people often think that certain parts of it are very ahead when it's actually behind. And many people think that certain parts are behind when it's actually pretty far ahead. And I think there, there has to be some work done, I think, in terms of ensuring or, or encouraging more communication between the people kind of working on the technology and these many applications that we see all over, whether it be uh, medical or education or otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I think the related to that, uh, you know, I think the one of the other things is really thinking about, you know, again, all of the uses of of VR and 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 sort of of technologies that have sort of preceded it um, in, in sort of trying to bring these communities together, whether in education or in health or general computing, um, really encouraging sort of governments and 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 sort of actors throughout the ecosystem to, to think about places where we can push basic science research further and mentioned haptics earlier and sort of all of the hard sciences that go into sort of creating these awesome devices and ecosystems often driven out of sort of research universities both in the US and all over the globe um, you know you find that many of these many of these teams many of the researchers that are working in VR sort of maintain their university affiliations many of the projects that have sort of led to, to some of the breakthroughs big and small Small sort of come from uh, from sort of basic science research funding or university funding. Um, so I think thinking about both the places where we are channeling some of the research that drives VR forward, but also you know again as we think about the future of our 
museums, our libraries, uh, where are there places where we can sort of begin plugging in VR in sort of new and innovative ways? Because ultimately, I think that sort of work and that tinkering, you know, outside of the private sector as well, is going to push uh, push the technology forward in, in really great ways and and get people, you know, more accustomed and, and improve sort of our skills development, um, and that helps everyone in the ecosystem. Yeah, and uh, from a technological standpoint, like when you're experiencing VR, there are a lot of things that can take you out of that experience that I think need to be overcome. One of them is the cord. I mean, tripping over a cord while you're in a virtual world is, is really jarring. Um, the same thing goes for knowing that people are watching you outside, if you're, if you're part of a larger demo, for example. Um, and I think the, the biggest one for me was looking down, and in some of these games, they haven't developed uh, legs. So you look down and you have no legs, and it's like the most like jarring experience, just like, where'd my legs go, right? I think that these are simple things that you're gonna have to overcome. All right, so we're about to go to questions, but before we do that, um, I know that all of you on this panel have been reading a fair bit of science fiction as it relates to AR and VR, um, possibly in anticipation of this panel, possibly just because you love it. Um, lightning round, what is your pie in the sky science fiction place that you wish AR could go, VR could go, and it can't get there yet? And yeah, sure. So I'm going to mention Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. Uh, in, in Snow Crash, there's a place called The Street, which is a virtual reality location that everybody wants to go to. It's, it's got expensive real estate, and everyone wants to build there. It's super shiny, as you can imagine. But everyone has their own avatar. And you can make it, because again, there's no constraints on, on physics, you can make it whatever you want. So people's hair are on fire, or they're, they aren't even people. Like, I'd probably be a turtle that goes really fast. Like, just, just for <laughs> irony's sake. Yeah. Awesome. Tim. Hmm. Uh, I mean, I like the idea that uh, some of the technology might get to the point where we can kind of give it some parameters and it generates a world very, like, at high fidelity based on that. So I would love to be able to say, oh, this movie is depicting this world. I'd like that to be converted into a VR space, you know, and have the machine be able to execute on that. Excellent. James? Yeah, I think sort of the possibilities for really advanced haptics down the road, uh, you know, I think that's really exciting to me, the idea that, you know, we'll get to a point where you can sort of pick up a rock, uh, you know, or, I mean, I don't know why you'd want to pick up a shard of glass, but like a shard of glass in VR, and, you know, we can begin to recreate, and, you know, with, with really high fidelity, and there's great work going on in haptics right now, but just high fidelity haptics that, you know, could make everything from picking up a beaker and, and you know, doing sort of everyday chemistry to, to sort of deconstructing a house feel like it, it does in the real world. I think that's going to be really exciting. All right, with that, we're going to open it up to audience questions. All right, front here, Baron. I, Anne, I loved your invocation of uh, Nabokov, and it got me thinking, you know, really, fiction teaches us empathy, to, to relate to people who are not ourselves, and what you've just been describing is, is an immersive form of empathy, to be able to relate to people who might have physical disabilities, let's say, or missing limbs, think, or the police shooting example. I'm just curious, from everyone on the panel, both technologically, how well that will work, and then sociologically, how you see that actually being integrated into our, our lives, our education, our, the kind of ongoing education, the kind of training and empathy that we all get by reading novels. How do you imagine that will change what it means to be human? Uh, thanks, Baron, for the question. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, with empathy in VR, you're going to end up in a place where, for example, you can play a part in a movie. Like, pick your favorite movie, maybe like Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Um, and you can uh, actually be a character in that movie, and they explore that in the book Ready Player One. Um, and I think that uh, that's going to be a super compelling use case moving forward. And you already see uh, Magic Leap, which is a company that's creating augmented reality technology. Um, they have a film studio attached to them. And I think that that, that entertainment aspect is going to really uh, drive that forward. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think like any great medium, I think maybe at some point in the future, we will eventually kind of come to like what the canon of VR experiences are. Um, and I wonder whether or not they'll eventually be like the, the sort of great books, like you're in school and like everybody has, has to see these three or these five um, VR experiences. That seems like something that might happen in the future. 
Yeah, and I mean, I, I think you just look at, you know, we're at the beginning of sort of the great storytelling taking place in VR, and you see what sort of documentary filmmakers are doing, and others, and I think we really are going to continue, and as the, the film techniques and the special styles uh, in 360 film and in, in VR really come into, come into their own, uh, and that canon sort of forms someday, I think we're really going to see the types of experiences that you know we've experienced on other mediums, in books, in fiction, uh, in in film, uh, we're going to see that really come to life in, in VR, and I think it will become a part of our you know perhaps our everyday educational experiences. Certainly, the way we experience new works of art uh, and and learn about the world and history, um, and I think that that's going to be really exciting, and sort of baked into a, in a very natural way. We have already gone over time, but I want to honor questions, so we're going to do two more very quick questions. Um, purple vest in the back. If you could identify yourself as well. Hi, my name is Annabelle Blackburn. I work for a social media agency, and so we were super excited about all of the conversations going on about VR and AR. And I'm totally on board with all of the comments that we've had today, but some of the responses that I got uh, in my workplace about the uses of VR was, well, what about, say, VR addiction? And what would that mean of people being locked into VR spaces and no longer engaging in the real world? Would that be an issue? And the other question that came up that I would like your, your remarks on is, you mentioned the interaction of policy, law, and VR and AR space. And we could think about use cases where you could use VR and AR to experience things that are criminal. And how would we, how should we respond to someone who goes and, you know, is extremely violent in a VR world and then comes out and doesn't want to engage in that in a real life world until they do? Would this create a block for the development of AR and VR? Should it? Is that a, is that a creative, a productive question to ask? Who wants to take that? Yeah, I can, I can kick off. And I, I think it's really, a really great question, um, you know, thinking about sort of whether it's safety and, and, and all of the things, you know, the, the, the sort of with, within the realms of possibility for all that, that could happen in VR. How are we making sure that we're thinking about these challenges? And, um, you know, and I think it really starts with, you know, some of the principles that, that we've learned across mediums to date, which is, you know, getting to the addiction question, for instance, you know, really promoting responsible use, you know, just as we would on a mobile phone, on a personal computer, and in other mediums, and, and, and really looking at just making sure that we're investing in understanding, you know, when, uh, when people need to be educated about the right way to use a technology, or, um, you know, if we need to have sort of rules of the road about, about what, what is working, what is not, if parents are fully informed about a technology. I think all of those things that we've picked up uh, you know, over the course of the last few decades in other mediums, they apply to VR. And, you know, and I think all of our companies that, that are sort of working and building in this space are really committed to making sure uh, that people have that information um, and, and that the, the software and the hardware and, and you know, are, are developed responsibly and that people uh, you know, can, uh, can use the, 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 the technology responsibly. Um, when it comes to, to sort of uses that, that you know, we may want to shield and protect people against, I mean, again, I think the, some of the same principles apply, which is making sure developers are educated, making sure consumers are educated about what is happening, that there's sort of clear indications of what an experience is and what it isn't. Um, and then if there are things that sort of begin to develop organically that uh, maybe we didn't foresee or didn't plan for, that we're sort of nimble and responsive in creating, whether it's tools or reporting mechanisms uh, or working to sort of educate people so that, um, you know, we're, we're sort of fixing any challenges that arise that maybe we didn't foresee because, you know, no one can predict everything that's going to happen or every use um, or, or, or sort of every sort of tangent uh, for, the, for the technology or the software, the hardware. And I don't think that's problematic. You know, I think that leads to the vast majority of the time really exciting sort of new pioneering uh, uses. But then we just have to have the sort of responsibility and, and the tools in place to, to, be, to be nimble when that happens and sort of course correct uh, when, when people go somewhere that they don't like. Yeah, so to add on to that, I think that um, people think that video games are pretty antisocial, but I think that VR can get beyond that. Uh, we were talking about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence can make non-player characters in games be extreme, uh, seem very real. So you can interact with them in a very natural way. Um, and I think you can use VR to, to re-socialize people. So one example is if you're uh, having trouble speaking in front of crowds, you can use uh, virtual reality to do public speaking demos where you can practice in front of a crowd, even input a heckler, for example, um, and, and that can make you better at, at uh, your social skills in real life. 
So we had a little bit of a miscommunication on time. So consider this a, a little intermission that we got to ask questions. We're going to resume some questions uh, here on the panel, and then we'll open it back up to audience questions at the end. So apologize for confusion, but this way we got more audience participation, and who can complain about that? But don't worry. We're going to open it back up to questions at the end of the panel here in just a few minutes. Uh, and so you guys will have a chance to, to weigh in. I know I saw a number of other hands out there. Uh, one thing I, I want to then build on um, that was brought up uh, by virtue of this audience question is the relationship between VR gaming and VR enterprise, let's say. Do they exist on two separate tracks and you, you sort of have the gamers that use VR and you have enterprises that use VR? Or is gaming essentially an R&D lab for the rest of, of VR as we're going to see it deployed across more and more industries? You know, Tim, I think you, you'd be well equipped to speak to that. Yeah, so there's the, to maybe reveal that I'm a huge nerd, uh, I've been really excited about this game recently on Steam called Shenzhen IO. And Shenzhen IO is basically a simulation of um, making like electronic circuits. And you basically have to learn a uh, computer language just to play this game, right? And what's amazing is when you get to it, you're like, oh wait, this is just like, this is just designing circuits as a game. <laughs> um, and, and I think we see lots of examples of that, particularly because the drive to simulation as entertainment in VR is so strong. Um, and so I, I, I really do buy the idea that, you know, a lot of this applications that we're seeing in gaming uh, might eventually kind of come back to, to enterprise. And is there a policy implication of that? I feel like often um, you talk to someone who is in the public policy space and they might be like, oh, gaming. You know, I, it, it's not considered the same as when you're using a VR technology to map a human vascular system. Right, so well, I'm not, I'm not and, trying and, to say that they're, and, yeah. No, but I think that there's an important message there to communicate, right? And uh, uh, James, is this uh, something that you, you operating in very robustly in both of these spaces, is this something that you think needs to be part of the public policy messaging on, on well, the issue? Ed, I, I mean, I think there's, you know, there's so much cross-pollination, right? Like, what happens on the gaming side can inform, you know, what happens yeah. for many of the non-entertainment, non-gaming applications and vice versa. And so, yeah, I mean, I do think it is important to sort of, you know, to sort of explain that you know in both of these fields they're sort of informing each other that sort of the, what happens in schools and universities as well as in gaming studios and in uh, you know in, in filmmaking shops like this all of this work I think contributes to sort of the next major and minor breakthroughs um, and so you know to sort of say you know gaming is good or is not good for this and mm -hmm. you know the medical use is and is not good for I think I think a lot of that you know starts to fall apart a bit I mean because the the ecosystem really is reliant on you know it, it is still such a growing and 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 you know a space where there's so much tinkering and 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 development that it really is reliant on all of these developments. There's, there's sort of not one sector that I see as being more or less important to sort of, you know, the space that we've sort of been talking about that we'll get to years down the road where, uh, you know, the technology is, is used uh, much more widely and, and, and the developments have sort of moved along. So I think it is important to, to really sort of explain that there's a lot of, of cross-pollination and the developments across these fields are, are extremely, extremely important. Yeah, and uh, you could actually imagine it going the other way too, which I think is something that's worth pointing out. That yeah. like applications that we see in the enterprise space may help to inform sort of games that get produced. Oh, I think that I think it's a great connection that often is lost, particularly when we're some talking about something as vast as VR, when there probably isn't a VR policy, right? You have congressional hearings, I think, very importantly on AR and VR technology, um, but as Ann pointed out, a lot of the policies that affect this technology are very traditional technology policy debates. Um, particularly, uh, James, how do you view, in that sense, VR as uh, you know, a policy message? Do you view it uniquely in that you need to be presenting a VR-centric policy to a lawmaker, or do you view yourself as a piece of the privacy debate? Yeah, no, I mean, I think with you know, with, with VR, I think it's right. I mean, it's, it's such a novel technology. I think the thing that, that, that I look at and, and, and looking out around the world, you know, is, you know, are we doing the sorts of things? Have we put in place the building blocks so that research teams can go and get running, so that, you know, uh, schools can, can get running, that doctors can go? And, and what are the things that we've been talking about, whether they're sort of novel policy questions or some of the sort of longstanding, uh, you know, 
uh, calls for sort of improving STEM education, let's say, or other things, and, and where are there sort of some existing challenges that we've identified as, as sort of needing to sort of help, you know, improve the, the prospects and, you know, for VR? Um, and then where are there spaces, too, where we're considering regulation or other things where we may, you know, chop off sort of some future development or some future arm of, of, of VR's growth. Um, I, I don't know that that's always sort of readily apparent, but, you know, what, what I try to emphasize in talks uh, with, with policymakers is, is, is really focusing on sort of pro-innovation policy. And that, again, that goes across fields and looking at what's going to, to sort of help support these emerging teams and research that are doing work in, in VR and AR, and then sort of assessing some of the things that we've done uh, in, in, in recent memory and, and seeing where, where did they cause challenges for sort of new and emerging technologies and, and, and trying to get past that for, for, the, for the growth of the VR and AR industries. And Tim, we, we touched on cardboard earlier, and uh, I think Google's really been a pioneer in bringing VR to the people, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it. One of the exciting things that I often hear about I in the VR space is um, worker retraining. You know, it, it's a dominant conversation in our country right now about how do we get people who have formerly worked in an industry that no longer may have as many opportunities to rapidly and effectively retrain to work in a radically different I industry. Uh, a very high technology solution in you know, the form of VR may be one of the ways to do that. Can you talk about the possibilities there, but also probably the major logistical hurdles to making that happen? Yeah, so I, I think that's that's a really exciting possibility. I mean, I think there's two, I would say the, the TLDR is I think there's a lot of work to be done yep. to get that to work properly. I mean, I think one of them is we've democratized or are working to democratize access right, to the visuals, yep. but a big part of the retraining will be actually being able to input into these systems very effectively as well. And that is still remaining, that, that's still kind of a limited thing, right, thinking about kind of not only being able to experience VR, but also be able to interact with that world in an effective way when your platform is just a folded piece of cardboard. Um, I, I would say a second thing, though, is that I think we have to think really hard about, like, what the curriculum is, right, because it isn't necessarily just like, oh, you pretended to be a welder, so now you can go weld, right? Um, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done with how does these virtual experiences, you know, maybe even integrate with traditional lecture learning or other things like that. And I think that's still a big part of the picture that needs to be worked out. I think we just need to see more experiments. Uh, either of the other panelists have anything to add to that and it's in being such a dominant conversation going on right now? <laughs> All right. Um, with, with that, we're going to go back to the people in that case. Um, here in the front, Black Laser. and um, nuisance um, caused by uh, it, where the plaintiffs are alleging that um, just the mere placement of the GPS coordinates um, equates to a trespass. And as you mentioned, the law in Illinois, and I believe that there's been one, um, an ordinance passed in Milwaukee County uh, regarding the same kind of thing. So where, how can you see the industry um, uh, mitigating some of that pushback? very hard question. Um, so there are over 4 million Pokestops all over the world. And you can imagine that if they had to uh, ask permission for where each one was going, that this type of application would not exist. So there's a balance that needs to be struck there. One of the things that I advocate for is um, companies allowing, like, having the flexibility to self-govern. So what Niantic did in, in that case, um, they found that some of their Pokestops were in inappropriate areas, Holocaust Museum, um, also in uh, close to places where there were landmines um, abroad, um, and they were able to recognize that and remove that. Um, and so I think you did see them be able to react, but you just mentioned uh, there is already a structure in place to deal with a lot of this, and that is the courts. Nuisance laws, torts, those things can are already um, operating and, and working to work some of this out. Green shirt. Um, I'm a child psychologist and spent most of my career working with really traumatised children in refugee camps and uh, children's prisons and elsewhere. And I guess one of the things that fascinates me about this is that a child's brain can't differentiate between reality and virtual reality. Um, and I guess one of the things you've been talking about is things like uh, virtual reality will help us build empathy, where psychology tells us that it doesn't actually build empathy, it builds voyeurism. So it looks like empathy, feels like empathy, but doesn't actually change our behaviour. So I guess m my question in all of this would, is, 
Are any of you working with behavioural psychologists and others to test some of these assumptions as we go, both to maximise the benefit, but also limit what can actually be some pretty significant downsides, particularly where this relates to children and their ability to not really differentiate between reality and almost reality in any way, shape or form? So yeah, I mean, we think this is a big part of um, making sure this technology gets developed in the right way and has the good effects that we think it will have. So uh, on my team, I work very regularly with uh, child psychologists, developmental researchers, um, and people who have been kind of in the haptics and optics space for a very long time. Uh, and I think we're, we're not just addressing the kind of psychological questions, but also the many kind of potential physical questions around the technology as well. Um, so this is actually something that we're, we're actively staffing for, and we think it's actually a really important part of our development process. Yeah, and I'd just add that, you know, I mean, we, and currently, so Oculus products are, are 13 plus, um, but, you know, we do try to think ahead and, and you know, begin, so the research behavior psychologist, uh, I can't say that, that we've necessarily worked with that community distinctly, but our research teams really are working ahead and, and sort of thinking about some of the big questions uh, and collecting data, of course, too, about sort of what is happening, whether it's in, you know, storytelling experiences and gaming experiences, both with the aim of, of sort of making the, 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 the technology and, and the VR experience as comfortable and as safe as possible for everyone, but, but again, better understanding sort of what are going to be the impacts. So we're, we're still at the beginning of that process, but absolutely, it's, it's, it's on everyone's minds. Um, back, green t-shirt. Hi, um, I had a question. Uh, I'm, I'm in the mapping space, and um, I wanted to know uh, if you guys have thought about the applications for uh, especially AR, but also VR in wayfinding and navigation, and uh, how how to take kind of mapping and navigation from a 2D world to the VR and AR space? Yeah, actually, I think so. Having played Skyrim uh, and a lot of first-person shooters, where you have up in the right hand of the screen uh, a map that where you turn, it denotes that, and it'll show like other characters on the screen in, in, in terms of dots. Um, and then it also has a compass. Like that would be so helpful as an application in real life. I keep uh, getting turned the wrong way on Sixth Street, um, and if I had that compass, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> It's, it's not something that, uh, I mean, and I, I can't speak for every team at Oculus, it's, it's not something that, that I've worked on uh, specifically, but, you know, I mean, again, I think in our focus in sort of creating a space where software developers and researchers can begin to do work in that field, I mean, of course, Oculus is happy to sort of be a platform that, you know, creates a space where people can experiment, whether it's in mapping or, or other fields like that, but, I mean, I, I can't say that, that I've done any work on that specifically. Front, um, black shirt. Hi, um, Margaret Rose with a company called Get Analytics. Um, so I was as a huge science fiction fan, I was particularly excited about the many references to Ready Player One, um, but then also noticed a lot of points around using it, using VR for media, using VR for training. Um, those are all very time consuming. So I was wondering how kind of, what's the longest that you or someone you know have actually been in VR? And then what are the implications of that, kind of given the context of the other things you shared? I'm fascinated to know, too. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's no more than 30 minutes. Uh, yeah, no, so I've been, uh, I think the longest single use has been maybe like an hour. Yeah, it's probably somewhere around an hour, hour and a half maybe for my longest single use. I mean, I think, you know, and, and you the question about sort of if, if people are maybe, say, only using it, um, you know, in, in sort of shorter bursts, what does that mean for all of these different sort of experience, whether it's training or other things? I mean, and again, I think we'll see uh, whether it's worker training that I know we've talked about or new media, you know, film and storytelling. Um, I think we will see sort of the form uh, adapt to a lot of the different uses and different communities, you know, maybe designing 10 and 15 minute experiences, other may be going, others may be going longer in storytelling. I think there's a ton of flexibility and we'll sort of see short form, we'll see longer form experiences, um, and, and I think there will probably be a healthy range across the board depending on, on the use case. Yeah, for me it's about an hour as well. Um, but I think that uh, one thing that's pretty cool, there's an app called Big Screen VR, and the core user base of this app uh, actually plays for 20 hours a, uh, a week, which is a lot. 
Um, but what this app is, is you're sitting on a couch and then you have your actual computer screen that is then visualized in the virtual space so people can watch YouTube videos together. Or you can give a tour to, to, ugh, you can give a tour tutorial on how you can actually um, work through uh, a problem, like a problem set or something on your computer, or even learn how to use it better. And I think that's actually a really effective uh, application. Um, and, and so I'm excited to see where that goes. Yeah, and I think one of the things that people in the market, I think, are waiting to see is whether or not there's a differentiator in terms of hardware here, like whether or not certain types of hardware platforms will just be better for certain types of VR experiences. Um, and I think that's still being kind of worked out as well. In the back, a black t-shirt. And then, Raza, you're next. I, I know uh, addiction has been mentioned already, but I was just curious from a policy perspective if you think that self-regulation is sufficient um, to you know, protect consumers, you mentioned uh, Nabokov, but I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with David Foster Wallace's vision in Infinite Jest, where entertainment has become weaponized because it's so addictively entertaining. Do you think that self-regulation is sufficient for consumer protection in, in AR and you know, VR? Yeah. Oh, okay. go ahead, go ahead. yeah, so one of the things that I think uh, in the future is just what are you going to when are you going to stop using VR? Like, how do you know when reality is and when it isn't? I think we're going to have to deal with this question of what is reality? Because you can imagine a future in which many people are living in VR. So Ready Player One explores this a little bit, where people go to school, they have jobs in VR that they're attending. And once you spend that much time in it, we have to question if this is the real reality. <laughs> I would just add, I mean, I think I would, take, I would take the question, I guess, from a slightly different angle, which is, you know, I think it, it will be important to, when, when we identify sort of harms um, in, in VR as in any other medium, you know, with our mobile phones or with personal computers, um, you know, really sort of taking a look at whether or not um, we don't have the sort of tools or the dialogue or the means to address them. Um, and so, you know, if there are harms that aren't being addressed, and they, you know, do represent sort of a serious problem, then I think it's, then it's time to sort of have a conversation about, you know, whether or not we need to do more through law and, and public policy. Um, but, but really focusing on, on the harms that we're trying to address, identifying them clearly, and, and I think as a first step, you know, really saying, all right, you know, let's make sure that we're being responsive when, uh, you know, there's, there are reports of, of misuse or uh, of challenges, and, and exploring all of that, trying to address those harms sort of, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a sort of collaborative dialogue first, and, 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 you know, and again, holding, holding, you know, companies and actors across the ecosystem to account if they're not addressing them, uh, and then if that doesn't work, uh, you know, uh, then, then moving to a place where we say, all right, you know, let's look at, at more options. Yeah, that's definitely how we think about it. I mean, and to go back to James's earlier point, I think we're not without precedent here, right? That there have been other media where we have been worried that this would be the case, and so I think it's worth it looking at those historical stories and how we approach those problems as a guide for what we do here. All right, Raza, now you. Sure. Hey, so I wanted to ask you about how you're thinking about VR and AR technology affecting different populations, in particular, how you're perhaps thinking about accessibility for disabled communities, both in, in terms of the challenges they may have to access the technology and sort of the opportunities you might see there for serving those you know, otherwise you know, left out communities. Yeah, one application that's really cool. Um, so paraplegics, they forget, their brain doesn't remember how to walk and they're using VR with a brain interface to actually um, teach them, reteach re them how to walk. Um, and it's worked actually at the 2014 FIFA World Cup. The kickoff was done by a paraplegic who was trained through VR to remember what it was like to walk and those neural connections um, were able to transfer through an exoskeleton and a, and a lot more work to actual physical outcomes. Yeah, and I think it's those types of uses that are the really exciting ones. I think sometimes you hear this trope at VR conferences where it's like, oh, well, it's great. Like, if you can't get there, we'll just, like, give you the VR substitute. And I think we should be, we should be worried about necessarily drawing a full equivalence between being able to simulate going to a museum and then actually being there. Um, that being said, I think the, the kinds of uses I'm really excited about are like these, where it's actually a tool that's actually something that kind of allows people to achieve something even broader than what they were able to do before. And then just in terms of the sort of everyday development of VR, and I think all of the work that's going into sort of the efficiency of the devices and the experiences will ultimately form 
you know, I think a lot of great work on the accessibility side. So to take something really minor, you know, doing text in VR in general is sort of still a challenge. And there are all of these questions about how to position it properly. Uh, you know, and, and, and this is, you know, whether in storytelling or in sort of general applications. But as that work continues to come together, I think in terms of just the, the everyday operation of VR, uh, I think we'll see accessibility move forward as well. There, there are still so many early days challenges um, that, you know, across experiences everyone is trying to work through on the hardware and software side. Um, but, but accessibility, of course, is, is going to be immensely important. And as these sort of, you know, sort of basic challenges get figured out, I think it will also push forward a lot of the work on accessibility in really great ways. All right, with that, we actually are done with the panel uh, this time. Uh, so appreciate you bearing with us. Uh, actually, you got to ask more questions, so I don't know that I need to apologize for that. But thank you again for coming. One last plug entirely unrelated to AR and, and VR, but very important to technology, to the state of Texas, uh, and to our member companies at Consumer Technology Association. None of you have taken an Uber or Lyft while you were here. Almost every one of you who came last year probably did. If you valued that experience and want to be able to use those services here in Texas, we are working with the legislature to make sure that they get legalized throughout the state. Uh, that means Austin as well. You can text on your phone RIDE, the word RIDE, R-I-D-E, to 52886. That's RIDE to 52886. And that will let the legislature know that you care about this issue and that you want to see ride sharing back in Texas. So thank you again for helping with that campaign. Thank you again for coming to this panel. Really appreciate it.